Thank you, Molly, for being with us with your wonderful gift of music. Always, always a joy. So, a couple of weeks ago, I talked to you about listening with our inner being by listening with our hearts, not just our ears. I presented this idea to be present to our values and our truth that we hold most dear and being able to do the work of filtering out all the noise that we are bombarded with from advertising, especially this time of year with all the political advertisements, the sensationalized news and leaders who say all these inflammatory things to play off of our fears. When we hear these things, they tend to rile us up into a state of instantaneous reaction. And that moves us into a state of our autonomic response system of fight, fight, or freeze. Directly related to the power of listening with our hearts instead of our limbic brain comes the other side of the communication equation namely speech. If we listen to our hearts, how can we communicate our heart truth so that other people can relate and hear um, with their hearts what we have to say? And our story earlier from the people at the First Unitarian Church in Chicago, we have an example. In the middle of a contentious debate, we heard how James Luther Adams found a way to break the pattern of responsive, defensive speaking. Instead, he spoke his truth in a way that led to transformation. He moved beyond the stimulus action, reaction, play that was playing out. He listened deeply with his heart to the council member who struggled with the tension of wanting to preserve his cherished religious freedom a core value of our faith, and another value of inclusivity and other people wanting to have the same freedoms that he had. Already people in that meeting had armored themselves up for a debate. The focus was on winning the argument instead of listening to the idea at hand and doing the right thing of desegregating the congregation. By pausing and listening to his heart, James Luther Adams was able to take what I call skillful action and ask a simple and meaningful question that went to the core of the dissenters and the people in the room's beliefs, while at the same time honoring his own truth and the truth of the person that he was confronting. In doing so, he took a risk he made himself vulnerable, and the response that he received broke the lingering tension that made that late night, early morning board meeting seem to never end. And I hope we never have a board meeting that lasts that long. In Buddhist tradition that I am studying through my mindfulness teacher training, we would call his action right speech which is a part of the Eightfold Path that the Buddha laid down as a means of working towards achieving enlightenment. So how do we engage in right speech, especially when it feels like people are shouting at each other a lot of the time? How do we communicate so that we can say what matters to others and others can say what matters to them. It's not easy, yet it's not impossible either. The first suggestion I have is to embrace the acronym WAIT, which stands for the question, why am I talking? This is a way that we can try to get by our autonomic system that wants to respond instantly. 
I'm guessing that you probably have all had a similar experience, like maybe when you're listening to the news on the radio and you hear something, and before you even realize it, there are all sorts of curses coming out of your mouth. Weight reminds us to pause and ask ourselves, where is my response coming from? Is my response just a simple release of tension that needs to happen in the moment? Or if maybe I'm saying it in another group of people, how will that response affect the other people in the room? Will it build connection or will it create more separation? This technique is not about stuffing our emotions. It does not ask us to pause and consider, or it does ask us how to pause and consider how our action and response builds connection or increases separation. When I am exploring a mindful, heartfelt communication as one of the basic teachings, it's something that I think about because I want it to create a reverence for life and I want it to serve as a mode for understanding and building connection. These are some of the filters that I use when I'm trying to speak in thoughtful ways. Often what we find initially in our, the space of our own initial reactions is less um, about what that particular issue is, but more about our immediate needs. Are we threatened? Is it comforting? Um, do we feel like we're judging somebody because they just don't know the truth. It takes a moment to pause and investigate before responding that allows us to move forward into deeper awareness. One of the hardest exercises in my teacher certification program was for a week, every time we are in a conversation and we wanted to respond to somebody, we had to pause for at least 10 seconds before we responded. It sounds easy enough, but I dare you to try it. When you do, you might find that if you wait for another five or 10 seconds after that first 10 seconds, the thing that you initially wanted to say no longer seems important. Instead, something more powerful and meaningful has arisen. This simple technique is helpful because we spend a lot of time responding automatically to the stimulus in our lives. There's an old story that is um, attributed to Roosevelt Franklin. I don't know if this story is true or not, but it shows how we often move through life without being aware of how we respond. According to the story, FDR was often, um, de often described the, the pain of enduring long receiving lines at the White House. He complained that nobody paid attention to what he really said. So he decided to do an experiment. One day he went through the line and with each person as he shook their hand, he would murmur to them, I just murdered my grandmother this morning. The guests, however, would respond with things like, marvelous, keep up the good work. God bless you, sir. We are so proud of you. It wasn't until the end of that receiving line when he met the ambassador from Bolivia who actually heard him. The response from the ambassador was, I am so sad to hear that, sir. Are you sure she really deserved it? Yeah. Because we have such strong patterning of fear and wanting that comes from our lim limbic pattern patterning in our being, most moments on some level, what we are saying when we respond to somebody has been fear or been um, formed by our fear and wanting, whether it's exaggerating 
or just being on autopilot in our responses or gossiping or whatever it is. One of my teachers, Tara Brock says, quote, this means that it takes a very dedicated attention to come up with a thoughtful response instead of simply a quick reaction. It's training like anything else, the same way we work with our thought, thoughts or our mind, working with how we inhabit the presence where we're speaking and in the way that really serves life." End quote. When I first started trying to use the language of mindful speech, I found it really awkward and sort of an encumbrance. Um, I would often think, try to think of a skillful response, but it wouldn't come to me until like later on in the day or maybe a day or two later. Slowly, however, with more reflection and practice, I find that occasionally I am able to offer a very skilled response in the moment. And just think about it. By the time I am old and gray, I'll probably be really, really good at it if I keep practicing. Well, well maybe at least when I'm a little older. The first step in developing wise speech has to do with attitude. How am I relating to this skill? If it feels like it is something that is limiting you or that you're caught up in self-judgment because you're saying, I'm not doing this right or not doing it well, instead of being helpful, it often constricts you or shuts you down. When I think of developing wise speech as an adventure, it helps free me from the old patterning that I have and I feel more relaxed and present to opportunities as they present themselves. Pema Chodron says, we don't set out to save the world. We set out to wonder how other people are doing and to reflect on how our own actions affect other people's hearts. The second teaching of mindful speech is being aware that the impact of our words and how um, what words are going to be determined by the quality of the presence that is there. If we're in a state of mind where we are in an ego sense of needing to protect ourselves or to prove something to somebody else, our communications are going to perpetuate that separation. When we begin to shift to attend and befriend, which is a term that uh, Tara Brock uses, then we shift into a larger sense of interbeing. Then we are going to be serving life and we are going to ex be expressing our love for life. Protecting ourselves in speech is natural and pervasive. Research actually shows that, the, that we all tell many little lies embedded in even an ordinary conversation where you wouldn't even think you would need to lie. But this happens all the time. It happens because deception is one of our early and most primitive evolutionary tools that we have for survival. Think of it, how viruses try to hide themselves by being invisible or um, insects camouflage themselves, or a cat raises the hair on their back to look intimidating, and how often we hide ourselves to try to act intimidating when we are feeling threatened. These are natural ways that animals and human beings have learned to protect ourselves from the very beginning of our existence. Again, Tara Brock says, we also do this in other ways too. We present ourselves to get hugs. We present ourselves to get power. We present ourselves to get more security. But deception's reality, or deception's really, really deep in our system. Most of the ways that we usually go to get approval involve some sort of deception. If you think about the many moments when you're in a conversation with somebody and in some way what you are presenting is in order to have that other, 
person experience you in a way that you want to be experienced versus just being spontaneously being in that moment. We want to get approval. We want to cover over what we think is going to bring disapproval. And so this is a big, big challenge to heartful communication. Well, developing these skills of deep listening is extremely important. Developing skills of mindful speech are also extremely important. There is so much more to developing mindful speech. Today, I am leaving you with these, this very simple and basic introduction on how we respond in speech and the actions that offer us an incredible way of respecting the inherent worth and dignity of others and ourselves, while at the same time allowing us to move into a deeper interconnection with each other as we notice the things that separate us and we risk the opportunity to get deeper in our communications because it's not just about listening, it's also about speaking as well. As Thich Nhat Hanh said, that is our good news. We have the opportunity to speak the things that are going well in our lives, to share the abundance that we all share and not get caught up in all the negativity of our reactions of the split second moment. Thank you and may you continue sharing that good news with each other and the world. Blessed be. Amen. <laughs>